Hello everyone, how do you welcome to one more important video as a part of the medic series and this time we have a wonderful cardiologist from New York City, Dr. Sandeep Joharji with us, who's been working with the heart failure program at Long Island Jewish Hospital. And he also happens to be a writer besides being a physician. Uh, he's written four books in total till now in turn, then there's something about the heart. And the latest one, which has been launched, is My Father's Brain. And that comes out of a rich real life experience of him helping his father beat, have a war, win over, go through all the travels that happen in Alzheimer's. So, He's been a cardiologist for 13 plus years over there. So hearty welcome Dr. Sandeep Georgi to this Medex series, which is run by Freedom from Diabetes here from India. Please, let's Thank have you. you come on board on the screen right now, getting into a candid conversation about um, Alzheimer's and what we can do for people who are going through Alzheimer's, the caregivers and others. And it'll be wonderful to hear all the inputs and rich experience you had while you handle your father that has come into the book. So first and foremost, of course, uh, uh, it'll be nice for the audience to know the known reasons for Alzheimer's as an experienced professional that you have understood. So please go ahead and share us the deeper reasons. Yeah, well, I mean, Alzheimer's is a form of dementia, uh, which is a brain disease, and it's one of the most common causes of death in you know, in, in the United States, where I live, but also in India, and really across the world. And it's a growing public health problem. There will be probably a tripling of the number of dementia and Alzheimer's cases by the middle part of this century. So, you know, it's a massive problem. You know, one of the problems in managing Alzheimer's is that we don't really know exactly what causes it. Some people think it's misfolded proteins in the brain called plaques and tangles. Others think that vascular disease plays a big role. Uh, vascular disease is obviously my specialty with, you know, in cardiology. Um, we do know that the biggest risk factor is age. And as the population ages, more and more people develop Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a massive problem. And, you know, it's something that's coming for all of us, uh, whether we are going to be patients with Alzheimer's or we're going to be caregivers for family members who have Alzheimer's, like I was, uh, but it's a massive and growing public health problem. Yeah. So uh, as a doctor who works on reversing diabetes, I've also heard and read that it's at times called type 3 diabetes, uh, an element of insulin resistance plays its role in Alzheimer's. Um, do you have any views on that, any inputs on that? I mean, it, that's uh, right now, uh, uh, speculative, but it's a possible reason why Alzheimer's develops. It's considered, uh, as you said, type three diabetes. It's, there is insulin dysregulation in the brain um, that is present in patients with Alzheimer's. Whether that's a causative factor or whether that's associative, you know, we don't really know for sure. But um, the fact is that people who have more vascular disease have more Alzheimer's. So diabetes clearly plays some role, but you know there there are other factors that <clears throat> scientists are looking at: uh, inflammation, lax and tangles, as I as I mentioned, which is something that Alzheimer, the original psychiatrist who identified the disease, mm -hmm. um, found in his microscopic slides. Um, vascular disease, viruses, bacterial infections all may be playing some sort of role. But yes, I, I would say that insulin dysregulation is definitely uh, one of the factors that may propel dementia. So all the diabetics and those with metabolic disorders watching this program right now, live or later, ensure that you kind of keep this factor in mind because it could be yeah, positive. Absolutely. Yes. So, and, and the role of exercise and meditation, again, keeps coming up in Alzheimer's, and I think it'll be good to take it up front as a question based on your experience. You know, in, in India, let's say, and through our program, we promote a lot of 
forward bending, backward bending, um, lymphatic drainage exercises, whereby, you know, stuck up lymph is moving inside the system, let's say, like surnamaskaras, chair surnamaskaras, which are easy for aging population, and also meditation, stress release. So on both these topics, which at times tend to have connections and are told in popular media, uh, as an expert on this, would you like to throw some light exercise and meditation part in terms of creating or you know preventing Alzheimer's? Yeah, I mean, again, there are associations that people who exercise more um, probably have healthier blood vessels in the brain and are in that way protected from Alzheimer's. There's also evidence that exercise releases certain what we call neurotropic factors that promote synaptic growth, synaptic regeneration, and potentially neuronal, you know, brain cell division and proliferation. So, so exercise, no doubt, is beneficial, both from the standpoint of helping to control diabetes and insulin regulation, but also in promoting vascular health and also promoting sort of brain regeneration. Di uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, is brain degeneration. Correct. The neurons die. And uh, anything we can do, like exercise to promote regeneration, uh, is important. Meditation is, is also important. We know that stress, emotional stress, can affect the part of the brain that uh, encodes memory called the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is, is one of the areas of the brain that degenerates in Alzheimer's. So anything that can, you know, can decrease stress may be beneficial because we know that, that brains in both rats and humans that are subjected to chronic stress and the release of cortisol have shrunken hippocampus, which is you know, the, the memory center of the brain. So um, you know, these are all important factors. Unfortunately, Alzheimer's and dementia are, is like a tidal wave, and uh, these factors can play a role in attenuating the disease, but they don't entirely prevent it. We don't have a way to prevent Alzheimer's uh, at this point or treat it once it's taken hold. Oh, interesting. Now, people, you know, whenever they watch any video, they want to know some quick things which they can adapt and implement. So since we talked on exercise, in case if there's any direction you want to give people, if there's any literature, any reading you've undergone, you've written a book, you've taken care of your father, you've seen some things you might have done it right, in some things you might have had in retrospect, maybe if this was clearer before, his health would have been longer. So any particular direction on exercise you want to give to the audience right now, which will help to you know attenuate or prevent or kind of postpone which, which could be helpful. Well, I mean, like I said, aerobic exercise is is very beneficial okay. um, for general health. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Alzheimer's is associated with aging. So people who are older tend to have more. So anything that can decrease the number of health problems um, is important. So I would say that, you know, a daily walk outside for people who are older or, you know, even a daily jog outside is is quite beneficial. But you know, the the main part of the book is the um, ethical issues that arise when you're taking care of someone with Alzheimer's. All the difficulties. Um, it's you know, yes, it, it's about the history and science of the brain and memory and brain degeneration. That's all there. But there's there's also sort of a personal story and and all the difficulties that arise for caregivers when you're dealing with a family member with dementia. So please share that because I think once Alzheimer hits your own parent, you know, your mother, your father, people who've been, you know, powerful, who've been role models and they are getting dysfunctional and whatever you went through in brief, of course, the book has been launched worldwide now and it's available it's, it's a pleasure for people to go through it, but any pointers as caregivers you want to give to the audience right now, please go ahead. Yeah. Right. I mean, look, you know, anyone who's taking care of someone with dementia knows how frustrating it is. And my goal in writing the book is to provide information about what dementia is and also to describe a sort of wrenching personal chronicle, my own story for what happened because it illustrates many of the conflicts and difficulties in 
caring for someone with dementia. So, you know, my when when I was going through this, there was really no book that was available to me. So I wrote the book that I had needed. So it's both a personal story, but it also has history and science. Now, the reason why it has history and science is because I think it's important to understand what's happening in the brain to sort of have almost like a neurological script for what happens. I think it helps people have patience with their family member when you know that Alzheimer's, for example, starts in the hippocampus, which affects memory. So, so why is your loved one saying that they don't remember what happened just a few minutes ago? Why they, the, they didn't have what they uh, had for lunch? Uh, but they, my father, for example, remembered the partition of India from you know, so many years ago. And I didn't really understand why. Uh, so the book explains why certain memories get erased and, and other memories you know, remain um, intact. It also explains some of the emotional dysregulation that happens. You know, my father was a very uh, patient and, and uh, mild-mannered person, but he became very angry and very, uh, you know, um, and that happens a lot. And the fact is that the hippocampus is right next to an area of the brain called the amygdala that processes emotions. So Alzheimer's starts in the hippocampus, goes to the amygdala, then it moves to other areas. I explain all this so that people understand okay, this is the phase, this is the stage that my family member is in. And I think when you know, when you have a roadmap, it gives you some understanding and patience. It's only when you don't know what's going on, when, when what's happening seems completely irrational and arbitrary, that's when you get frustrated. And so my goal is to alleviate some of the frustration of caregiving. Yeah, you keep, you keep fighting reality, and I think yeah. a lot of stress uh, happens because we keep fighting reality. And as a medical expert and as a son, when you explain your own emotional journey along with the medical journey of what and how it moves from the hippocampus to amygdala and other areas and how the emotional reactions may come and you are better prepared for that, yeah. the understanding of reality from an emotional perspective, from a medical perspective would definitely grow and it will alleviate the suffering of the caregiver uh, for sure. So, so many thanks for writing this book uh, from both the angles, you know, emotional and medical angle, which is going to benefit many, many people because there's no real book on this uh, written. So uh, yeah. any more things you would like the caregivers to kind of keep in mind so that they don't go through burnout or some of the issues that they're not prepared for, any any point as you already mentioned that somebody who was yeah. quiet becomes angry and you get confused. Yeah. Anything like this? Well, one, one, of you, yeah. one of the reasons why there's so much conflict is because the person who has dementia becomes irrational and they start to have sort of fantastic thoughts, almost hallucinatory thoughts, delusions. And I used to th think for the longest time that I had to fight those delusions, that I had to bring my father back into my reality. Oh. the reality of the world. Um, so I would tell him, you know, that the woman who's working for him, taking care of him, she needed to be paid. He didn't want her to be paid. I said, no, no, dad, in this world, if you work, you, you get paid. But it would cause him a lot of anger. More emotionally, when after my, my mother died, my father forgot that she had died. And so he would ask, where's your mother? And I would tell him, well, mom died. And then the next day or a few days afterwards, he would forget and say, well, where's your mother? And I would tell him, mom died. And that would cause him a lot of anguish. And then, and then it would rekindle the anguish every time he learned, because for him, it was always new. And what I learned is that it's really not fair to do that. Um, that you know, some my, my my brother and sister understood this intuitively. They they eventually started telling my father, "Oh, mo mom is uh, <clears throat> shopping, or mom is um, in Fargo where they used to live. She's on a plane. She's coming." You know, and that would relieve his stress, relieve his anguish. So they were basically lying to him, and I had a very hard time doing that. But I learned over the course of the caregiving that sometimes. Lying is the the most um, 
uh, beneficial. Caring, yeah. caring way of being that it upholds a certain measure of dignity that we we think that if you lie to someone you're not treating them with dignity but in alzheimer's because people forget uh and they experience anguish sometimes the most dignified way you can treat someone is to validate their reality validate their perceptions even if they're wrong or you think they're wrong and so fighting them is really um creates a lot of conflict and 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 i describe all this in a lot of detail in the book all the family conflicts the sibling conflict but what i learned is that the best way to alleviate that sometimes is to what is called therapeutic deception just to kind of tell people tell the patient what they need to hear at that moment to alleviate their anxiety yeah for example telling okay based on the recommendations we'll not be paying the lady who's working for you yes yes that could, exactly that could that could alleviate his anxiety though it's far away from reality yeah. Yeah. and yeah. she can reinforce that yeah 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 i'm just doing it out of out yeah. of good intentions for you very very interesting yeah. uh, <clears throat> uh any uh, more things uh, that should be done to create a safe and conducive environment for an alzheimer's patient yeah i mean you know i think you just have to um as a caregiver be there for the the patient you need to make sure that they're living in a safe environment you know in america a lot of uh, elderly people end up going into nursing homes i think it's happening more in india but in india there's more of a multigenerational homes where people take care of uh their parents we lived in the west and so we were kind of a hybrid culture where we were kind of partly americanized partly indianized um but i you know my parent my father ended up living independently albeit with a live in caregiver but you know we used to visit him every day um we brought him to our part of new york so that we could keep a close eye on him you know i think it's just important that you know what i learned is that people with dementia become very lonely and loneliness causes stress and increases the brain degeneration so i think anything you can do to alleviate loneliness um to be there for your family member um that's super important and and i talk a lot about this in the book strategies to do that and you know i i can't sort of summarize the whole book but um but you know you know it's basically a blueprint for what to do if you're faced with this situation uh, where a family member is declining from dementia uh what to do what some of the conflicts that are inevitably going to arise and what the science is so that you're best prepared for handling this difficult journey correct so i i see this book and this entire talk from two people's perspective one is the son the daughter who should get better ready for their parents in case if it happens and i think we've talked enough about it and more is there for everyone to explore in the book the my father's brain which is launched worldwide please go ahead look it up if you like it go ahead and buy it the second thing second audience which would be there watching right now or later will be the ones who will be saying i don't want to get into it <laughs> or i want to delay it i want to postpone it or never ever get into it and one thought which is the way it got triggered at the beginning of this conversation in terms of exercise and meditation another thought which is getting triggered to me right now is about purpose and about mental stimulation because if mm. we read a book like ikigai and the areas and places where people have lived 100 plus years okay mm -hmm. because purpose and principles itself drives a lot of energy through us besides yeah. a good diet besides a good exercise besides good stress management and positivity so yeah. i don't know whether it's covered in the book or not but started and if there's some input from your end for everyone besides the caregiver part of the program for them to not yeah. get into it would you like to share anything on the part of purpose and mental stimulation and you know after the 60s and 70s having something to look up to doing and Absolutely. contributing and learning yeah. and part of being a community if there's anything on that please share that yeah one of one of the aspects that is associated with longevity the most is having a purpose having a sense that that there's something that's going to engage you outside of yourself 
And, you know, I, I still think that one of the reasons why my father declined so much is because um, the great love of his life, the great sort of passion that he had, which was for science, he was unable to do. Um, and once he retired and he, he really didn't have that purpose to go to the laboratory um, to study the genetics of plants, which is what he was doing. Um, and he was a really an eminent uh, agricultural scientist, really known worldwide. Yeah. Once he lost that, I think it really accelerated his demise. So I absolutely know for a fact that, that um, you know, whenever I speak to patients in the hospital who are, you know, living into their 90s or 100s, one of the really common factors is that they have a sense of purpose um, and also a sense of calmness about external forces and, you know, they don't get too stressed out about things. So I think that's really important, but, but, um, but having a sense of purpose and, and, and a sense that your life means something outside of just your own existence, I think that's really important. Mental stimulation also, I talk about, about that a lot in the book, um, that mental stimulation builds what's called cognitive reserve. It increases the connections between brain cells so that when, when the connections start to deteriorate, the more connections you have, it's almost like a math problem. More, the more brain cells, the more connections you have, the longer you can function with dementia. Um, so education, cognitive stimulation is also very, very important. I, I talk about this a lot in the book. Oh, lovely. So nice. So I think we are moving towards the end of this uh, discussion, yeah. I think, a candid conversation. And um, it's good to see the reinforcement about exercise, about meditation, about purpose, about mental stimulation, uh, which is so important. I don't know, one just straight thought coming in my mind, and that is the role of coconut oil. I don't know if that was explored or not it just gets spoken at times but i don't know if you want to, if you would like to comment on it uh before we move towards yeah the, I, I i don't specifically write about um i i do write about nutrition in the book correct um some of the best data that we have is for like a mediterranean diet um mm -hmm. so i mean coconut oil i don't know enough about it to really comment on that but there is some evidence that um that uh you know um unsaturated uh, fats like olive oil um, have benefit and that a Mediterranean diet can have, you know, a lot of benefit for, um, uh, you know, decreasing heart disease, but also to decrease dementia. So I, I kind of summarized the best data that, that medical science has produced uh, on the role of diet in dementia. Super. So we've got a summary of diet, exercise, meditation, purpose, mental cognitive uh, stimulation, and the emotional and the overall medical aspect of the disease. So a well-rounded book that everyone can yeah. look up. So before we close, any closing remarks uh, we would like to give Dr. Johar? No, I mean, look, I it, the, the book just released in, in India um, uh, yesterday, May 29th. Um, and uh, but it's been a it's available in the U.S. for the last month or so. It released in the U.K. Um, so I really believe that for those people who are going through this journey or are afraid of developing dementia, which is really all of us, um, can really benefit from the insights that I provide because I spent years researching and sort of chronicling. Uh, what I went through and, and, and also doing a lot of research into the most cutting edge neurological and, and bioethical research. So, you know, hopefully people will read it and, um, and, and, and benefit from it. And they can always reach out to me at my website, uh, sandeepjohar.com and, and, and send me messages and, and let me know what they think. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Thank you so much, Dr. Sandeep Georgi, for joining in and sharing about this. And there's more to come with people reading the book and getting in touch with you. So thank you once again. Great. Thank you.